Welcome and thank you so much for your time. In this presentation, we're going to take a short tour of Blackboard. My name is Brian Yearling. I'll be your presenter today. I am a member of the Instructional Technologies Coordinator Team here in the School District of Waukesha. My other teammates are Wendy Liska and Jim Gagno. We're going to talk about Blackboard in just a moment, but first we have to acknowledge one key piece, and that is how our learning environments have changed in the past 15 to 20 years. At one point, there was really a single platform that was available for all classroom practice, and that was called face-to-face. -face. It meant that a student was sitting in front of you, and you as the teacher were working directly with them in order to instruct them. With the advent of technology, though, we see other platforms that are coming to life here and, and becoming available to us. And so it begs this really critical question, does a single platform classroom still suit the needs of our students and families? Now, we have other platforms. Uh, here in the school district of Waukesha, for instance, we have a platform known as eAchieve. That's an entirely online school. Students can um, receive their their degrees or their uh, diplomas from us without ever sitting in a classroom, without ever having to be necessarily face-to-face -face with their classroom instructors. And that's certainly an option. And we have the other side of that spectrum where we have t kids who uh, spend most of their time face-to-face -face and are educated in that manner. Looks like classrooms uh, looked, you know, 50 years ago. Um, but that's how many of our kids receive their diplomas and their education. What you see here is an example, though, of the different kinds of platforms that are becoming available to us. And that is because of, of objects like Blackboard and other tools that can allow us to start putting content online for kids in a wide variety of formats. And we're not just talking about static content like text, we're talking about dynamic content as well. Video instructions and self-paced lessons. In Walk Shall you hear us talk about personalized learning as we learn more about what it is and how to implement it in our classrooms. And it's difficult on either side of that spectrum to implement a personalized learning environment, either face-to-face -face or online alone. But what we're starting to see is that really we have a spectrum of options here uh, from face-to-face -to, -face to online. And as you look at this spectrum, you know, a along with answering the question of does a single platform cl uh, cl classroom still suit the needs of our students and families? The other question is, how do we move the needle from one end of the spectrum to the other so that we have a nice mix of platforms that meet most of our students' needs and most of our families' needs? We have some students who face-to-face -face every day may not be ideal, may not be possible, um, who may learn better in an environment where they have more of a hybrid version of that. What does hybrid mean, though? It means that the resources are available online, that kids can attend to those resources and possibly even attend class in some other platform than face-to-face. -face. While our classic structures don't necessarily support the ability for us to move to a full hybrid model, which I often equate to something like a collegiate classroom where you spend some time getting your resources online, you go to the classes when you need to or when um, the professor requires you to, but a lot of the learning is done outside of class on your own time. Well, maybe some of our, our structures don't necessarily support that entirely. We're certainly looking at changing the paradigm and starting to think differently about how kids are educated in our schools, K-12. And so what I challenge you to do is to start thinking about face-to-face -face and online as the two extremes and how you can move your classroom platform more from a face-to-face -face experience to a hybrid experience or from an online experience to a hybrid experience where kids get the benefit of that social engagement by meeting with people and working with small groups, but they also have the ability to be self-paced and get exactly what they need in online resources. So the challenge for you is how do you move the needle from whatever end you primarily teach it? Another foundational question in the school district of Waukesha that you absolutely have to wrestle with is this question. When students have a device available to them, and by a device, we're specifically talking at this point about an iPad. In the next two uh, to three years, every one of our students, K-12, will have a device in hand every day. They will be able to take that device home, most of them, and they will be able to use that device for a wide variety of tools. But we have, with, and that is called Waukesha One in our system, and uh, it's part of our personalized learning initiative. But when students have that device available to them every day, 
and they're able to go anywhere during class because we really provide a window to the outside world when we provide an internet browser, when we provide you know other apps that they can use. So they can go anywhere during the class. Where will you have them go when you get them online? This is one of the primary questions teachers who started to engage with students who have devices have asked. How do we keep them in somewhat of a structured environment yet give them the freedom to do what they need to do with those tools? So it's a question you're going to have to wrestle with. Every one of our Waukesha professionals is going to have to wrestle with that question and figure out where are we going to send kids when they have a device and co can go anywhere during the class time. So let's dive into Blackboard because this may solve uh, that problem or it may, uh, let's say, uh, provide an answer or solution. Blackboard is our learning management system, or an LMS, and that is a way in which we provide a structured environment online where digital resources can be placed, where kids can interact with one another, where they can interact with the teacher, and where a teacher can really develop an online presence for themselves and for their, for their students. Um, a learning management system, there are lots of them out there. Some of you may have already taken courses in other learning management systems. Um, you know, things like Angel and Moodle, there's a lot of them that are out there already, D2L, but Blackboard is the one that we have chosen for the School District of Waukesha. So one of the things that we get asked a lot is, if I'm just creating an online presence for myself and for my students, why not just create a website? Um, especially in the School District of Waukesha where we have the Google Apps for Education tools and we have Google Sites, a tool that could have you uh, and your students up and running in a in an online website in less than 10 or 15 minutes. Why would we invest the time and the learning into learning something like Blackboard instead of just jumping off and doing a website? Well, there's a couple of answers. Um, both really do put resources online, uh, but there are some differences for Blackboard that really make sense, and it's the reason the district has invested uh, heavily into that platform. The first is a single address for all classes. So I want you to imagine just for a moment that you have a son or daughter who is in a course where the teacher has put all of their resources online in a website. Simple enough. So they go to something like weebly.com slash Mr. Yearling. And that's the web address that, that, that they're going to. But let's say that that student also has two other teachers. And each of those teachers are also putting their resources on the website. On a, on a separate website. So now we've got MrYearling.com that they have to go to and they also have to go to Google Sites slash some crazy long name slash uh, Miss Liska. And then they've got another one that they have to go to slash Mr. Uh, Mr. Jonas. So now we've got three websites a teacher would need to, or a parent would need to visit. And you can see how that can become pretty confusing. Now start scaling that out a bit more. So we know that, for, for instance, in the middle and high school areas, our kids can have four, five, maybe six different teachers. If each of them has a different, uh, different address, that becomes a bit of an issue for our parents. Imagine that you now have a son or daughter in a different school, one in the middle school and one in the high school. What we have here is a lot of different addresses for our parents to remember and for our students to remember. And the reality is when we send people in a lot of different directions, they tend to go to none of them. So what we want to do is we want to get into a single address where all of the resources are placed, no matter who their teachers are. And we can do that with Blackboard. The address is always http colon slash slash bb9.waksha.k12.wi.us. Don't write that down. I'll put that up on the screen in just a moment. The next thing is parent review mode for all students. So uh, this is really critical. In Blackboard, when a student is enrolled, their parents or guardians are also enrolled. And as a result of that, if the parents are interested in doing so and the teachers have the proper permissions turned on in the Blackboard course, the parents can take a look at what's going on in the course, take a look at the resources. While they can't necessarily engage in the course, they can certainly have an eye at it. And when they want to see another son or daughter at another school, provided the, the teacher is using Blackboard there, with a click of a button, they don't even have to log out. With the click of a button, they can be in and viewing those, those, uh, that son or daughter as well. The third one is key, and that's this one right here, cross-course content sharing. So in cross-course content sharing, this is really a key for our teachers. We are all overloaded. We all have a lot going on in our lives. Our plates are full. And it seems that in education, we're getting more and more new things coming along, and we all kind of feel that burden. But the reality is, uh, 
sometimes we tend to make more work for ourselves by not sharing and letting others help us and working in course alikes and teach alikes. So what we can do in Blackboard is if a colleague of yours has created an assessment that you really like or a unit lesson plan that you really like, in Blackboard what we can do is give you permission into each other's courses and you can build those courses together or you can copy and paste those courses, uh, those items from one course to another without much issue. That's really difficult to do on a website so it's another reason we really like Blackboard. The final thing is that Blackboard defaults to privacy mode. Um, websites can do this but it's, it's a little bit more cumbersome and not always consistent. In Blackboard as we were talking about Parents have logins to, to get in and take a look at things, but teachers always have the ability to determine what parents and outsiders can look at. Additionally, if you do not have a login to the Blackboard system, you do not have a username and a password, you simply cannot get in to our BB9 uh, environment. On top of that, teachers have to enroll the users that they want in their courses. So even if I can get into the Blackboard environment, if I am not intended to get into your class per se, per se then I certainly have no access to any of those resources. This can be really valuable and while we, we do believe it's important to get kids online and having their things published and giving them authentic audiences, it's also important sometimes to give them a safe space to fail, to try new things, to let them blog and communicate. And so we can, we can say in Blackboard that it's consistently the case. So that's the reason we may want to consider, sorry, hang on one second here. That's the reason we may want to consider using a Blackboard over a website. Here's some other things that Blackboard can do for you. It's going to provide 24-7 anywhere access. And whether we like that or not, that's the reality of the world we live in. We have parents who have access to their health records online and their banking statements online and to their postal services and when things are going to be delivered. I can track something the mo from the moment it is shipped to the moment it's at my door in today's age. And so the reality is we need to give that same access to our parents um, and our students at home. Uh, the school day may end at a certain time, but learning shouldn't end at that same time. And the reality is we don't want it to end at that, at that given time. We want to give people the opportunity to see the resources they may need when they need them. The next part of that is that it provides a resource lifeline for students specifically. You can't be with your kids all of the time. Sometimes kids miss things. That's just an inevitable part of learning. And so what we want to do is provide our kids the resources they need when you're not present. And by not present, we don't always just mean when you're not available here at school when, or when you're not available at home. We also mean days when you are absent as a teacher or Better yet, days when you maybe have broken the group into you know your class into different groups and you just want kids to work on what they need to work on for their specific needs. That's where we really get into the concept of making personalized learning manageable in, the, in, in your classroom. And so Blackboard can certainly help with that. The last thing is a safe classroom collaboration. We just touched on that a moment ago, but it's really critical to mention. No longer do we have to worry about kids getting spam from the outside. Now the people who are in the course have access to the resources in a blog or a wiki or a journal. But kids can collaborate with one another in meaningful ways without those resources having to necessarily be seen or viewed by the outside world. So we'll talk about roles just very quickly here, but I want you to understand that there are several roles. Uh, your key role, the one you're going to serve most often in Blackboard, is as a teacher. And that means that you have ultimate power over that course, ultimate domain over that course. Waukesha, unlike other districts that we work with often and know about, really turns a lot of its management and um, technology responsibilities over to its teachers. And that's, I think, a huge credit to our professionals um, that we trust them to do those kinds of things. But of course, it comes with some responsibility in getting some of the work done. In Blackboard specifically, uh, a teacher has, a, has two critical roles. The first one is to be the architect of the course. And so we're going to work more on that uh, when, we, when we get into actually planning a course and structuring it. But here, we're really talking about creating a design for that course that focuses on the end user experience. Not the person who's teaching the course, but the people who are taking the course or interacting in the course. The other half of that is being the builders. And this is where we encourage you to work with your colleagues. If there are several of us who teach the same course or the same grade level, uh, who work with the same group of students, for us to work together in building and implementing the resources we need in that course, we're really going to be in a, a good place um, if we can do that. It's not always possible, it's not always beneficial, but generally 
kind of that idea of many hands make light work. Another role you have as a teacher is getting to be the bouncer of the course and determining which student and staff are enrolled in the course. When you want a new Blackboard course, I'm the person to contact, or Wendy or Jim, so uh, Brian Yearling, Wendy Liska, or Jim Gagno can create the course for you. But after that, we really turn the construction of that course, the enrollment of that course, over to you. And so that's a part of your role, is enrolling your future uh, students, if you're at the beginning of a semester or a trimester, enrolling your colleagues who you may want to build the course with, that's entirely up to you to do. Now. We talked a little bit about Blackboard from the parent side of things, but this is just a key and a, a graphic to help you understand that. With Blackboard for Parents, we can deal uh, in the single parent logon using information that we provide to our parents, and that will allow them access to each of their children's courses, provided those teachers are using Blackboard. So you can see why it's imperative that more teachers begin to use Blackboard. You may want to write this down. Um, we've got a quick, easy trip to, trick to help you remember it, but this is how you get into Blackboard. And so understand that there is no WW in this W in this address. The easiest way, the trick to it is, go to the home page of our school district website, waukesha.k12.wi.us, replace the www with bb9 and you'll be off and running. bb9 stands for Blackboard 9. Your username, it's everything before the at sign in your district email, and your password. Passwords are really kind of uh, for those of you who are new, is specifically getting much easier to work with. Uh, you'll probably be given one password, and that will get you into almost everything you need to get into, aside from maybe Oasis and a few other items. But your primary Zangle, Skyward, uh, Gmail password will get you into Blackboard. If you ever have a need for password um, changes, you're certainly welcome to email ithelpdesk at waukesha.k12.wi.us, and they can help you with it. So there's that information right there. Again, IT Help Desk is what you're looking for, um, and 1073 is the number for that. If you still can't get in, a person you may want to contact is jbinder at waukesha.k12.wi.us, and she can assign you a Blackboard track. Uh, this will be particularly, particularly an issue for those of you who have multiple schools. All right. So a um, couple of things here. As a teacher... You decide who has access to your course, and you ask instructors to enroll you in courses that you may want to teach with. So let's say the person sitting next to you right now has uh, a course that you teach. You can simply say to them, could you enroll me in the course as an instructor, or you know, I'll enroll you in the course as an instructor so we can build this together. Again, this is not an IT issue. This is something that you can uh, deal with yourself. Here on the right-hand side, you can see a screenshot of what it looks like. Up in the upper right, when you log into Blackboard, you'll see SDW here, and then uh, the SDW is kind of the main tab, and your courses are outlined here. So you'll see those courses will appear there. If you do not see courses appearing there that you need, you can always email one of us, the instructional tech coordinators, and we can help you with that. But I always encourage you to talk to, if you know the teacher of that course, talk to the people who are teaching the course, and they can take your, care of that as well. So this is just kind of a rough lay of the land here. Um, when you log into Blackboard, SDW again is that system home area. You'll see all of your courses here and course announcements. When you log in to Blackboard, um, what you'll be brought to is the, the dashboard for the entire system. What's nice about this, and as a teacher it's important to know, is that if your kids are enrolled in seven or eight different courses and they have to go into each of those courses to get new announcements or new information about the course, um, the likelihood that they'll do that is, you know, maybe when they're in it in, co in class or when you instruct them to do so. If you instruct them, though, just to log into Blackboard on the dashboard page under My Announcements here, you'll actually see all of the announcements from the last seven days for all of these courses. So if there were any in there, they would appear there. I also want to instruct this uh, critical piece. If you are not teaching in the eAchieve Academy, so if you if this is, course is not an eAchieve course, and most of them are not going to be, this report card module was built for eAchieve, our online school, and that is just for their students. Um, our students, the gradebook does not connect with Blackboard, and likely will not, at least for this for the foreseeable future. And so I want you to understand that what you see here is a report card 
based upon what is in the Blackboard grading system. Well, we don't use the Blackboard grading system or gradebook in the School District of Waukesha. So don't expect to see that there, but more importantly, instruct your parents. Don't in, in, expect to see grades uh, and accurate grades present there either. So once we get inside of a course, we'll go back to that, right? Once we get inside of a course, this is what a, a course can look like. On the left-hand side, you see links to the course content. This is entirely customizable. So where it says Writer's Workshop, Reading Workshop, BB9 Collaboration, that is something you might put Unit 1, Unit 2, Unit 3 are the names of learning targets. Planning a course is a bit of an art and more time than we, uh, more time is required than what we have today. But I want you to understand that you really want to think about end user the second time you've heard me say that. What is the end user's experience going to be like? Because they're the ones who ultimately matter. And finally, this is an in-course announcement of what's new. So here you can see there's 12 blogs and seven new pieces of content since the last time um, that I logged in. Up here in the far upper right, it's important to understand you should sign out of these resources and so sign out is available up there and then once we get inside of the course just a little bit more so here we've clicked on for instance BB9 blog or we've clicked on interactive tools or whatever we are clicking on over here it takes me into this layout here where you can see content folders and content items and downloadable files it's important to note that any kind of file that uh, you can upload to Blackboard it will pretty much take. The real key is can your kids do anything with that or interact with that in any meaningful way. So for instance, I use the example of smart notebook files. Smart notebook files at one point weren't really that accessible for our kids. They uh, didn't have smart notebook installed at home and uh, up for a very long time they couldn't even interact with it in, in any meaningful way other than while at school. Now on an iPad with the smart notebook app they can actually interact with a smart notebook file just as if they had a whiteboard at home and they were working on that uh, smart smart whiteboard at home. So um, understand that if your kids can open the files on the device that they're on, and they can with uh, a lot of these iPad apps that are available now, the, you can put those right inside of a smart note, or I'm sorry, inside of a Blackboard course and it will be accessible to them. What else can you do with Blackboard? Well, it's more than just a file storage place. In fact, uh, it is honestly a great place for interactivity in your course. A couple of things that you may want to be aware of. First of all, in the center here you see this uh, icon. Not something that's part of Blackboard, but it represents the groups function that is available in Blackboard. So one of the ways that we're going to be able to meaningfully per personalize learning for kids is by breaking them into smaller groups that have unique needs, are working on unique projects, um, are at different paces. And so the grouping feature inside of Blackboard really lets you do that. It gives you a way to oversee the work that they're doing and the communications that they're having, but it allows them to do that interaction in Blackboard. So for instance, inside of Blackboard, you could have four different groups, ten different groups, whatever it is that you need. You can allow students to self-enroll in those groups or manually enroll in those groups. So let's say um, you have a student, you know, they're doing some sort of self-paced learning. They can start in the first group, do their work inside of that group, and then enroll themselves in the next group once they've shown that they've learned that whatever learning target or objective is in front of them. So that's a way to allow them to do some self-paced work. Additionally, you can manually enroll kids in groups, perhaps say based upon what they know, their interests, things that would be meaningful in their you know learner profile um, that would give you some information about how they best work together. But the key is that those can be manually enrolled, self-enrolled, and you give them tools like a group blog, a group discussion board, a group area for them to exchange files. So they can do a lot of that work right inside of Blackboard using the groups feature. Really handy, uh, definitely going to have some meaningful impact on our personalized learning initiative here in Waukesha. Some other tools that you might be want to be aware of. There is a wiki tool. The wiki tool uh, basically allows you to create a a series of web pages, I'll call them, but instead of being a standard static web page, again inside of Blackboard, not available to the outside world, um, what you do is you provide kids the ability to do edits and changes on those pages based upon what they know, what they've learned, their interests. They potentially can work with one another, collaborate with one another, correct one another, but the really nice feature about wikis is uh, you can always go back to the history 
and see what changes have been made between versions. So for those of you who are thinking right away about how you could use something like a wiki, um, as a classroom teacher when we built our course wiki uh, for American literature, it was, a, it was a window into the world about what kids were actually contributing to their group work. So I would give each page a, uh, to a different group, and I'd say, all right, I want you to focus on the writings of Benjamin Franklin. You're going to write on Thomas Paine, and you are going to write on Nathaniel Hawthorne, let's say. And so I would take, I'd be able to look at that history and see what changes were made between Jimmy and Jenny's work and be able to see that maybe Jenny had only contributed a few words and Jimmy had written 90% of the work. So that's a wiki feature. The last one is a blogging feature. If you're not familiar with blogs, basically it's a um, it's a way to journal online, if you will, and it gives the audience the ability to comment back on that. You don't really ever change the core content of a blog. That blog, whatever the writer has put out there, is only reacted to by the audience. But it's a really fun and, and unique way to get kids writing, thinking about an authentic audience, thinking about how to get a point across in a meaningful, concise way. So I really encourage you to think about blogging. It also is a great way to teach kids how to comment, how to agreeably disagree with one another. And that's built right into Blackboard as well. So something to certainly think about. Um, we also have a journaling feature, a discussion board feature. The journaling feature allows one-way, I'm sorry, two-way content between the teacher and the student. That's all. The other, each kid has their own journal inside a blackboard. But for anybody who sent home journaling notebooks and you would, you would comment back to the student not based upon their writing, the journaling feature is a really good way to get inside of a student's head, get, really get into what they're thinking without it having to be exposed to all of the other kids like it would be in the blogging feature. Discussion boards allow you to think through and, and ask questions as a group, provide responses to one another. So there's a lot of great interactive tools inside a Blackboard. Um, the only other thing we're going to add that's really critical about Blackboard, it's available inside and outside of the district. It has, as we mentioned before, 24-7 access. It's available on any browser. It's available on any device. Now, some devices work better than others. Some browsers work a little better than others. But we really, it really is working on any of those browsers or any devices. If you're in the, in the case where, for instance, you're on a mobile device, most of our you know, kids and families may have that as an option. But it doesn't all have to be iPad or Android. It can be a wide variety. What we're looking at is a, an app called um, Blackboard Mobile. It's an app that the district has invested in. It's free to the students or any parents, anybody who wants to install Blackboard Mobile on their device. Uh, all they have to do is install it and then look for the school district of Waukesha and put in their username and password, and they will be linked right up. Uh, here you can see what Blackboard Mobile looks like. From my understanding, this, this interface will look a little bit different, but the idea is that Blackboard really is available anytime, anywhere. And for our students with iPads in hand, this is a great way to interact with um, the course. They can blog right from here. They can you know, socially interact with it. They can see new announcements from here. So it's a really great resource for us to have. Um, I will just mention to teachers, if you are working on Blackboard from a mobile device, though, and you want to add content to that, Blackboard Mobile is really not built um, as a content, you know, builder for the for the course. You really want to go through a, like a browser on your iPad, let's say, a browser on your phone, in order to add content to that uh, course. And really, using like the Chrome browser, the Safari browser on the iPad, work very well. There's only a few things you aren't able to do from the iPad or other mobile devices. So. Just encourage you, when you're in course building mode, Blackboard Mobile is probably not going to be the best option for you. You want to go through a browser. But when you're con consuming that content or interacting with that content, especially from a student's perspe perspective, Blackboard Mobile is the way to go. So, and that can concludes the presentation, just a brief tour of Blackboard. A lot of information there. We're going to put this online for those of you who are interested in, in taking a look at it later. Something good to share with your parents and, and students as well, if, you, if you'd like. But really, the key to it is, think about that, that question of where you fall on the spectrum again. Are you a face-to-face -face teacher? Are you an online teacher? And how can you move the needle from one end, you know, whatever extreme you're on, to kind of a more centralized hybrid version of your class so that we have the resources, we have the access, we have the involvement from our parents and we provide the, the potential for them to, to get involved in that course. Because that's really the challenge of teaching in a classroom where devices are present 
It's really the challenge of teaching in a classroom where technology has impacted the rest of the world outside of our classroom. Um, and so we encourage you to really dig in and think about Blackboard. So thank you for your time. And as always, if you have questions, feel free to email either Brian Yearling, Wendy Liska, or Jim Gagnon, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can.